an event is approaching, we know that we need to prepare ahead of time. You know, we don't just wake up on the day of and begin planning then. And that's true of events, it's also true of holidays. And we see that especially with Christmas. Sorry to bring your mind back to a holiday that we've gotten over for a couple of months now, but around Christmas time, you can't escape it. You can't escape the Christmas lights and the decorations and the songs, the movies on Netflix, the time off. All of those things in the lead up to Christmas focus our mind on the holiday. And hopefully, all of that external stuff going on around us is also an opportunity to look inward and prepare spiritually, to think, okay, how can I make space in my heart for the Lord to be born with me personally? Now, that's Christmas, and we have all these externals that help us prepare for it. Uh, But for better or for worse, there is much less fanfare around Easter. And as such, we probably spend less time preparing for Easter, not just outwardly, but also spiritually as well. Now, you might now even be thinking, as I'm talking about Easter, wait, is it almost Easter? Did I miss something? And no, Easter is actually still pretty far away. But this time that we're, you know, as we're slowly getting closer to Easter, we're entering this time period that is used in a lot of traditions as a time of preparing for Easter. And it goes from Ash Wednesday, and it lasts all the way until Easter Sunday. And in many traditions, that, that time period is called Lent, Uh, In the new church, we haven't traditionally celebrated Lent. Uh, You may remember we did uh, quite a lot around it last year, and we're hoping to do some things around it this year too, just as a way of actually taking the time to consciously prepare so that when Easter does come, we feel like it's really meaningful and it's, it's a powerful event in our lives. Now, if we want to know how to get ready for Easter, we should look to the Word to find out what preceded the Lord's death and resurrection? You know, that's what we celebrate on Easter. So if we're thinking, okay, how do we prepare for Easter? Well, what prepared the Lord for those experiences? And it's not as clear-cut as you might expect. We could look at Palm Sunday, of course, the Sunday right before Easter, on which Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding on the donkey, and the crowds came out, and they prepared his way. Um, But we could also look further back. I mean, we could look all the way back to his birth that we celebrate at Christmas. I mean, after all, Jesus' life from the very beginning to the very end was this continuous march to conquer and to overcome the hells. And that march culminated in Easter. Now, there isn't a correct answer per se. It's not like the word anywhere says, here's where you should start thinking about, you know, here's where Easter begins or here's where the Easter season begins. Um, But there's an interesting middle ground between birth and Palm Sunday. And I'm going to focus on this as it shows up in the Gospel of Mark. In this Gospel, there are a handful of indications that uh, Jesus is beginning his final journey to Jerusalem. And it's telling these stories along the way as that journey is happening, and it doesn't really draw attention to the fact that that's where they're headed. Um, Because we so often read these stories out of context, in many of these cases I hadn't noticed before that this is what they're talking about. It might say, you know, Jesus was on the road, or while they were on the road, or while they were still traveling. Um, And I would just think, oh, they're just traveling around. But if you look closely at the context, you realize actually Jesus is starting to make his way to Jerusalem. Now the first references place Jesus traveling through Galilee. That's the area in which he practiced most of his ministry. It's right around the Sea of Galilee. But then he explicitly sets his face towards Jerusalem, and he starts talking about the dire implications of that journey. So I'm going to share this passage. And in this passage, it references they're on the road to Jerusalem, but even here, um, the city itself was still a long way off. When it says they're on the road to Jerusalem, it doesn't mean, like, there it is, they see Jerusalem, and they're almost there. It's... Uh, a long trip that might have taken a few days still. But it says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. 
And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now, you can well imagine why it says the disciples were afraid here. They were embarking on a journey that would result in their Lord and Master's death, and maybe even their own deaths. They also weren't natives of Jerusalem, and they were leaving behind their homes in Galilee. And if we understand some of the geography and the history of that journey, it starts to reinforce this spiritual significance. So just to give you a little lesson on the geography, um, if you're not familiar, Galilee was an area in the north of Israel. It's just to the west and the south of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee itself is actually below sea level. So it's a pretty, you know, it's a descent into a valley. Galilee goes up into the hills, but it's a low area. And culturally, Galilee was a backwater not really a pretty, not a central location, not a cultural hub, you might say, in the modern world. And then Judea, where it says Jesus is passing through Judea, that's further south, and Jerusalem's in Judea. And to get there, he had to pass down along the Jordan River. And as you're going down the Jordan River, even though the Sea of Galilee is already pretty low down, the Jordan River takes you lower and lower into the earth. And when it spills out into the Dead Sea, you're actually at the lowest point, uh, the lowest point of dry land on the planet. So you're descending down, down, down uh, into uh, the, the valley there, and you come to a city called Jericho. And then from Jericho, you actually ascend up a mountain again. So then you ascend up into Jerusalem, and si- the city of Jerusalem is sort of overlooking this valley. There's other mountains and valleys in between. And Jerusalem is the capital. That's the the hub, the great city. You know, it's the city of the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah. It's where the temple was located. It was the center of all Jewish worship. So this was the core of the kingdom and of the land and of everything they believed. So in short, Galilee was away from things, but also safe. Jerusalem was the heart and soul of the land, and going there at this point in his life, after saying the things that he had said, was going to guarantee Jesus' death. So these locations and the traveling from one to the other carries some of the spiritual significance. Galilee, far removed from the center, was a place that stands for outer things, external things, things unrelated to deep spiritual matters and so on. And that's the state we spend most of our lives in. We're very at home in that state, just our daily lives. We're not constantly fixed on spiritual things. Even the most spiritual person in the world isn't. You know, the most spiritual, religious person in the world still has to take the trash out and pay taxes and do their dishes. Like, That's just part of life, and we spend a lot of time there. And it's okay to be there. It's actually the way the Lord intends it. But it can also feel all too safe and comfortable, so much so that we don't want to push to the deeper things that will unsettle our lives. You know, if we've we've managed to have those external things stable and balanced and grounded, we don't want to do anything to upset that. Now, those deeper things are represented by Judea and Jerusalem. Overall, Judea stands for heavenly love, and Jerusalem for the most important teachings of the church. Of course, in this case, they actually represent the opposite. In other words, in this case, when there's a corrupt ruler there, there's a corrupt system there, they stand for selfish love and the entrenched ideas that justify that love. And those are some of the things we'd rather not have to grapple with. 
You know, why can't I just leave those under the surface, ignore them? Life is easier without having to think about them or confront them. Just let them be. Consider the fear that the disciples has had as they walked towards Jerusalem, as they're walking towards certain death. Wouldn't it be safer to stay in Galilee? And likewise with us, wouldn't it be safer to just deal with the day-to-day -day mundane stuff of life instead of broaching those deep-seated spiritual issues? And in fact, in one sense, absolutely, yeah, it would be easier. It would feel safer to not go into those deeper things. But without going through with those explorations of our true nature, without pulling out the ugly parts of ourselves that we try to ignore, we can never have the true triumph and blessing that are represented by Easter. And I love here that Jesus' journey is both a descent and an ascent. You know, he's descending into the bowels of the earth, the lowest point on the surface of the earth. And then he ascends up to what should have been this capital, this pinnacle of worshiping the Lord and goodness. And when we descend into the low and dark parts of our lives, we're also giving ourselves a chance to ascend into deep and abiding love. It's both a descent into ourselves and a chance to ascend to the Lord at the same time. But what does that have to do with preparing for Easter? I'm certainly not suggesting that you spend the next seven weeks in deep spiritual angst. You couldn't possibly function and do that. Rather, as a step of preparation for that kind of inner work, I might suggest adding something to your daily routine that pushes you to think more spiritually and to do more self-reflection. Again, it's this sense of just starting that journey, not being there yet, but you're going from Galilee to Jerusalem. You're, you're trying to make that transition. What are the things that I could add to my life that would help me have a more spiritual mindset, that would help me focus a little bit more on the Lord? Or you could go um, the other way and subtract something from your routine. Take a habit that you feel like, this habit has really distracted me from spiritual life. I need to remove it from my behavior. And again, in a way that might help me focus more on spiritual things. And these don't have to be big or over the top. They're not in themselves the destination. They are the road, though, that leads to those deeper struggles and fights. The road that leads to the meaning of Easter. There are many ways that we could do that, and there's, there's many ways that it could happen, that if we start doing that, how it leads us to something deeper. Um, it could be the, uh, the, take the form of rejecting a bad habit or introducing a spiritual habit, as I've said. And at first, doing one, one or the other of those things might not feel very significant, might feel very mundane. Oh, it's just a small little adjustment, a small little change in how I treat other people or how I go about my day. But sometimes those little changes can lead to real conflict and so real growth. So I, let's just walk through an example. Let's say someone has the bad habit of making half-hearted commitments and not following through on promises. And in the time leading up to Easter, he says, you know what, I'm going to really focus on rejecting that bad habit. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If I say I'm going to do it by a certain time, it'll be done by that certain time. If I tell someone uh, something that's important, I'm going to really mean it. Now, prior to making that change or commitment, he may have largely ignored the problem. It hardly hurt anyone. It's not a big deal. And besides, he could change any time he wanted, like, oh, I'll save that for another day. But in making that commitment and saying, I'm going to make that change, he starts out on this road towards the underlying issues. And maybe he has a real problem with commitment that comes at a level of resenting other people who make him commit to things. And anger um, when keeping his word causes him these inconveniences. And maybe it, it opens up this deeper struggle. Again, on the surface it seems like a small thing. It's just starting out on the journey. It's going on this road. 
But those little things, just little changes, once you start working on them, can actually lead to some of those deeper things. Now, that could happen. It could happen that you, know, you start thinking, what's a habit that I want to adopt, or a bad habit I want to get rid of, that I want to work on? And it could happen that it's really pushed you to see some growth that you need to do on a deep spiritual level. Or maybe not. You know, spiritual growth does not keep to our timeline. You can't predict that you're going to work on something small and meaningful now, and by Easter it will have grown to something much bigger or that it will have revealed real spiritual work you needed to be doing. It may happen right away, or it may happen after months, or it may happen not at all with one issue, and so you move on to another small habit, and you add that, and it has a nice impact, but it's minor, so you add something else, and that has a minor impact too. It's not a guarantee that we can you know, lay out this timeline, uh, especially when we're talking about months and weeks and days. Like That's just not how spiritual growth works. But those opportunities to really dig deep won't ever come up if we're not willing to um, make room for them. And that preparatory work that we do, that external work that we do, just adding habits, removing habits, that's something that can allow the Lord in his own time to draw our mind to the work that we really need to be doing, the deep work we need to be doing. The teachings of the new church compare it to a craftsman shaping a diamond. The craftsman shapes the diamond, but the craftsman isn't the one who provides or creates the light that shines through it and out of it. This is what true Christian religion says. In the precise degree to which a man prepares his understanding by means of truths from the word, does he adapt his understanding to receive faith from God. And precisely as he prepares his will by means of works of charity, does he fit his will for the reception of love from God. As when a workman cuts a diamond, in doing this he fits it to receive and to emit the glow of light, and so on. One prepares himself to receive God and to be conjoined with him by living in accordance with the divine order. And the laws of order are all the commandments of God." So we prepare and adapt ourselves by keeping the commandments of God. At times in mundane ways, and small ways, and seemingly insignificant ways. But it's the beginning of the work that leads deeper and higher and to profound life and love. Now in talking about all these things, we're mostly talking about a state of preparation. It's just embarking on the journey, starting down that road of what can I add to be a little bit more spiritual. But I want at least to end here by mentioning the destination, where we're going, where we're headed. As we know, for the Lord, he arrived in Jerusalem. He preached, and he confronted, and he was crucified. And of course, he then arose in triumph. And when they found the empty tomb, an angel informed them where they would see him again. And at least for me, this, this phrase here, this um, message from the angel, takes on new meaning when I see it in the context of this journey from Galilee, down the Jordan River, down into the depths, and up into Jerusalem. The angel said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So after all the events of Easter, Jesus went before them back into Galilee, back to where they had come from away from the antagonism of the great city, and back home. And remember that Galilee stands for the more external parts of our lives. And indeed, after any powerful spiritual transformation, the Lord leads us back into everyday, ordinary life. The difference, though, is that now the Lord goes before us and is with us in those mundane, day-to-day things. So as we prepare for Easter, 
we're now just starting on the journey, putting in place those things that will lift our minds and our hearts to the Lord. And ahead of us might still be some intense conflicts that will be stirred up by this journey. And we might even be afraid of starting, afraid that even a little change to look deeper will upset our comfortable lives and wreck some of the foundation and stability we've built. But the final destination, where this path takes us, isn't conflict, and it's not even glorious, overwhelming victory. The final destination is that having triumphed, we should return home and find peace there, the same peace that we want right now and yet might elude us on a deeper level. So take the first steps, no matter how small, on that road to Jerusalem and back again. Amen. Thank you for listening. To learn more, visit newchurch.org. And to connect with other people, visit us at groups.newchurch.org.